Genre. In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. And wouldn't you know it, I haven't done my homework again. But luckily, dueling genre captain of captains Scott Corelli is back to host and he's bringing someone who honestly should have been on Ideal Remake a long time ago, and that's totally my fault. But it's Nick Jimenez. Hi, guys. Hi. Thanks for, thanks for having us on, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> I think the term we decided for Scott is a high father. Uh, father. Yikes. I did not decide on that. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys did that, it was behind my back. <laughs> I, I was always under the impression that the high father sees all and knows all. Uh, right, yeah. That's what we say in the secret meetings that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's going to be a high father, that means that, of course, that eventually we're going to have a doomsday uh, not doomsday oh no you mean in the in the no scots club where where there is a scott but it's just scott tofty there's no scots club oh that's a good yeah yeah that's also a good reference that's not the one i was going for i just can't think of his name now and it's gonna bother me who's the guy who has planet apocalypse dark side dark side yes yeah yeah uh oh well this joke would have been really good (laughs) <laughs> anyway well, uh, you know <laughs> what if i'd gotten it right just the just the crowds would have been cheering oh, crowds of the people who understood the joke mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, high, high father is the, the one who is, is in charge of new genesis i know that i don't know that that's <laughs> a lot of people's knowledge that is within their grasp it's not even within <laughs> my grasp and yet somehow that's where i went but I'm pretty sure we're, make, we're remaking a movie today. So yeah. what movie are we talking about that I, I can't watch because it's a scary one? So we this is one that is near and dear to Nick and I's heart, I think, because we have talked about remaking this a billion times. For those of you who, don't, who don't, haven't heard me on the show before or don't know, Nick and I are, are writing partners. And this is like we have like a list of like like five things, you know, that we're just like that's i we want to do that i want to do that one yeah. and we talk about this one a lot like oh we uh, could write the shit out of yeah like an, elm, an elm street yeah really <laughs> solid elm street remake yeah nightmare on elm street nick do you want to run down the plot of a nightmare on elm street for sam hold on before you do that i gotta finish the intro is oh. nightmare on elm street a movie that has been will be or should be remade all three <laughs> yeah there you go and i'm yeah. guessing it, should be by you two yeah, I mean, like, you know, I think I think whether, regardless, like, I think Freddy's due for a return. It's mm-hmm. been 11 years since he graced the big screen, and it was a, a, a dud, yeah. large, mm-hmm. by and large. Um, and In so, yeah. Prep, like, I watched both. I watched the original and the remake. As well. Okay. Oh. Because I, I wanted to, like, please, get please. a sense of, like, what I didn't like about the, of, about the first remake to, like, you know, remind myself because I only saw it the one time in theaters, and and was like, "Wow, what a piece of shit!" <laughs> um, and uh, and and I just wanted to refresh my memory of like what I didn't like, and and I definitely remembered that I didn't like it. What I did not remember was that cast was nuts in that movie. <laughs> yeah. um, Connie Aaron, Britton you has, Connie Britton is the mom. Oh wow. Yeah, crazy. Anyway, that's crazy. I yeah, like how my like, first pull was Aaron Yu from Disturbia because that, <laughs> that, that got me psyched back in 2009, 10. Oh, I was like, yeah. oh, Ronnie from Disturbia is in this. <laughs> is, is this is this one the knife hands pedophile stalking in your dreams guy? Yeah. So like the original like legend of Freddy Krueger, the, mm-hmm. the the killer of Elm Street. And Scott, correct me if I'm wrong because like I haven't seen OG Elm Street a lot mm-hmm. compared to the other ones. Weirdly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like he was this child rapist. No, a okay. murderer. Okay. murderer. Chi- just a child. Oh, that's murderer. the remake. Yeah, the remake is he's a he's a rapist pedophile. In yes. the original, he's just a child serial killer. And he and so he, he weirdly just, that is you know. better. Yeah, and <laughs> Scott actually, I think it's too. <laughs> it's an important <laughs> distinction yeah <laughs> for thematic so scott would you mind taking over the the the, the oh lore, yeah actually? so 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 basically in both the original and the remake you're following one character that is kind of established as like the main character well less the protagonist so yeah the, the main protagonist and she's having bad dreams 
And she's like, I, I don't know. There's this guy that's in all of these dreams. I don't know what it means or why it's happening, but it's really scary. And I don't want to go to sleep. And about like 30 minutes into the movie, she gets killed um, while she's asleep in bed with her boyfriend and her boyfriend, like, and he, she gets, he gets, she gets killed in her dream and, and the injuries uh, happen to her in real life. And so from the outside world's perspective, she was fine in bed with her boyfriend. And now she is a bloody mess in bed with her boyfriend. And so obviously her boyfriend is uh, getting the blame for the murder. And what the boyfriend um, sees is the girlfriend like flailing in her sleep as unable to wake up as like real cuts are forming on her body. And the boyfriend's right. like, what's happening? Right. Christine, right. wake up. Or, you know. <laughs> and so, and so she dies at the, the character that you think is the protagonist up to this point. Um, and then we are, are reintroduced to our actual protagonist, Nancy, who is that girl, Tina's best friend. And then Nancy and the other kids on Elm Street are all sort of like having the nightmares of this guy, Freddy Krueger, with who's wearing a glove that has knives on it. And he's just sort of like taunting them in their dreams. And if they die in the dream, they die in real life and they, they sustain the same injuries. And then at a certain point when she's like trying not to sleep, her parents make her sleep and have a doctor like oversee it and see what's going on. And then she starts flailing around again and all of that stuff happens. When she comes out, she has a hat in her hand and it's Freddy Krueger's hat. And that's when she realizes that if she is holding on to something in the dream, mm -hmm. when she wakes up, she can pull it out of the dream. Ooh. Um, and so then you get so it's this a superpower we've always wanted. Yeah. So then she sets up this crazy elaborate trap in her house, like home alone style and goes to sleep and then wakes up holding Freddy Krueger, brings him into the real world and then just like walks him through these traps until he dies. And that's, that's the movie. And what you learn is that her parents and a cabal of other parents all figured out that this guy was the guy that, that killed all of these kids. And so they got together and they set them on fire because they're like, well, we don't want a child murderer walking the streets. And the cops, like he got off on a technicality or something like that. And so they murdered him. And so he has been, he's like the whole point of Freddy Krueger is like, they killed me because they wanted their kids to be safe. Well, now their kids still aren't safe. And that was like, even in their marriage. dreams, right? Even in their dreams. Now the important question is, is, how committed to the source material was that one episode of uh, the Simpsons uh, Halloween House of Horrors? <laughs> Definitely the spirit. Yeah. Because um, yeah. like my favorite part of that episode and Elm Street is the surreal imagery that mm -hmm. is created from a killer that uses your nightmares as fodder. Mm -hmm. Like Freddy gets more powerful the more afraid that you are and the more unsettled that you are. So like things like in the Simpsons episode where Willie is like a train and he's trying to eat you. <laughs> it's like Bart doesn't have time to like think that's not real. Cause he's running for his life, you know? Yeah. So pretty faithful. Yeah. So um, it sounds like, it sounds like this movie does kind of what I always wanted the movie inception to do. Yeah, no, for sure. Like uh, it, it's really interesting how Wes Craven and Christopher Nolan look at the idea of running around dreams. I think it says a lot about how those two artists kind of see the world. And mm -hmm. uh, it's I'm, I'm really glad you brought up Nolan, Sam, because uh, he's going to come up in, in my some of the ideas that I've had for from for my remake. Cool. Yeah, I was I was thinking about Inception a lot, especially watching the original. And it's because there is a logic to everything that's happening. There are rules that that the characters figure out about the way that the dreams work. So like, for example, when she's looking for Freddy to grab him as she wakes up, she's wearing a, she sets an alarm on her watch and then goes to sleep. And in the, in the dream, she can reference the time on her watch <laughs> because like the time on the outside, as long as she's wearing the watch inside the dream, she can know what time it is outside of the dream. Oh, and wild. know when the alarm is about to go off and when she needs to grab Freddy. 
And so like, but though, but that's like a very elaborate rule system in, in a very similar way of like the elaborate rules in Inception. Yeah. The, the, the coolest part of an Elm Street movie for me is when the, the group of teens that are getting hunted or the protagonist, they start to, you, you can try to outsmart Freddy. Mm -hmm. You can play by the rules and outlast and outmaneuver. And so like, to me, it's more thrilling than as a kid. I like all these movies now, but you know, like Jason or Michael Myers lumbering towards you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as scary to me as like this smart creature that you're trying to like outwit and play at its own game. Yeah. It's trying to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing about, about all of that, that dream stuff that you're talking about, Nick, all that kind of comes later in the franchise, you know, like mm -hmm. watching that first one, it's very just like, I'm having a nightmare about a boiler room and I'm in a boiler yeah. room. Oh, he's coming at me. Yeah. And yeah. he's coming at me. Like it's not as elaborate of a, of a dream mm. like logic. Yeah. yeah because um, uh, for con for prep work, Scott, I watched, rewatched a uh, nightmare on Elm street, part two, Freddy's revenge uh -huh. and nightmare on Elm street, three dream warriors. Mm -hmm. The best where, one. Yeah. The, the best one written by Frank Darabont, uh, <laughs> the has like, you know, really horrific nightmarish sequences, you know, where like Freddy is like a giant stop motion worm or like, I don't want to get too graphic, Sam, but yeah, like the you imagery. You can describe there. things to me. Okay, why did I don't want you to, yeah. You, you would not believe the stuff that got described to me last Halloween episode. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like there's a scene in three where a character is being led by his tendons, like marionette strings by Freddy. Like uh -huh. muscle his, tendons? Like his like uh yeah, that would what you call that, right, Scott? Like yeah, the, yeah, the, like the, the tissue. Tendon, like the tendons in your in your arm, in your forearm. Also, I should point out, I've written a horror movie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, so I, like for, it, for yeah, I had a lot just, of I won't fun. be able to watch my own thing. <laughs> The irony, the cruel irony. Yeah. Uh, I, it also feels a little bit like um, like the Matrix in that like mm -hmm. you're plugged into this other world and anything that mm -hmm. happens to you in that other world happens to you in the yeah. real world. If you die in the dream, you die for real. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very accurate in terms of how this, how the process works. And it's one of the things that I actually kind of feel like I want to shift up personally. Like I want the dream world to be insane and and follow dream logic where like yeah. you walk through a door and you're suddenly like somewhere else and then you walk into another door and you're somewhere else you know like right yeah yeah you turn around you're driving a car right right and you kind of always know what you're doing in the back of your head like oh that's right i'm going to the store right now i remember yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i've had, i kind of like pulled into what my reoccurring dreams and nightmares have been my whole life or mm -hmm. images that stick out to me because I think that's what Wes Craven brought a lot to in that original movie. Yeah. And like, you know, what, where do I keep going to in the recesses of my <laughs> psyche? Right. Right. Well, Cause I guess another question is what kind of dreamers are you? Cause I like just speaking for me, I, people talk about, uh, man, now I can't even think of the word, uh, conscious dreaming where you're aware that you're dreaming. Mm -hmm. Lucid dreaming. Thank you. Yeah. Lucid dreaming. And I, I've never, like, the only time I'm ever aware that I'm dreaming, it's because I'm literally about to wake up. Or, like, the world is collapsing around me as I'm waking up. Right. right. And just, like, the whole concept of, like, inception of these movies of just, like, you are aware that you're dreaming and you're fighting things in the dream world. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is so alien to me. Mm -hmm. But I'm always curious if, like, that, if that makes, puts me in the minority. I mean, do you both have lucid dreams? Like, what type I, of dreamers are you if you dream? I have one vivid memory of lucid dreaming because I remember being aware that I was dreaming. And so I kept like a, like a, like Deadpool or a cartoon character. I would grab it reality and rip it like a page mm -hmm. until That's I was cool. in like, in like a setting that I liked. But normally my dreams are incredibly boring and clinical and are just like, Oh, I haven't been around that group of people in a while. And like, that's the weirdest thing. <laughs> I mean, that works. My dreams yeah. always like, it, it's like it makes sense when you're in the dream, but like it, like it's weird rooms fit together that don't belong. You're riding mm -hmm. a giant guinea pig to work. You're being dragged along, and you literally get dragged through a stump. And now you're in a classroom, and yeah. snakes, snakes everywhere. I don't have those very often. I don't have that, like those big, are the big, only big ones crazy I have. dreams. <laughs> Scott, what about you? Yeah, I mean that's 
that my my dreams are always like they make total sense when I'm dreaming them, and then as soon as I wake up, I'm like, what the fuck was that? Like, what, was <laughs> that? what was any of that? Why was I doing that? Um, and and yeah, that's sort of like the thing that I would want to sort of play with. But I get that it's like it's a difficult thing, right? Surrealism and and you know making that feel honest is very mm. difficult. Um, right. That's and, some of the Freddy sequels. Show. Right, right, right. And making it feel like something you can follow as an audience member is mm-hmm. also very difficult, which is why I think that it, 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 it's like the the visuals of it need to um, follow the dream logic more than because, you know, you could you could say like, well, maybe part of Freddy's power is that he is able to when he's in your dream, he's able for to like wake up your conscious mind, even if you're still dreaming, you know, like mm, it, it wow. could, you know, it could be something like that where it's like the thing that you're talking about, Sam, about like not being aware that you're in a dream and just dreaming stuff that makes total sense in the dream. And then, right. You know. Like could Freddie manipulate someone to like, even like drive a car and go to a building in his sleep at his command of, you know, right. like, like, like hypnotizing someone. Yeah, I think yeah. it like especially if the original movie has Freddy being pulled out of the dream world and put into the real world, mm-hmm. it'd be interesting to see the flip of that of someone being stuck doing something, but in reality, because in a dream you you're on rails, you're often just doing exactly the thing that comes next. Hmm. Yeah, you're not like in control in any yeah. kind of conscious way. Right. I don't know. It's one of those things that that gets in your brain and then just sticks there forever, just doing <laughs> the dream stuff. Yeah. In terms of the remake, the thing that I was really upset by with the remake is how unimaginative it is. Um, It is real boring. Uh, It is a guy falls asleep in a diner and he wakes up in his dream in a diner that's empty and all the lights are (laughs) out. Um, And it's, it's a lot of shit like that where it's just very unimaginative. And, uh, uh, so like that was always a, a, a huge bummer. I don't like that. They changed him to be a pedophile. I also really don't like the idea that somehow these parents were able to keep this a secret, this cabal of parents that killed this, this guy. Um, this would be like my, my whole angle on this. I, in my opinion is that the kids find out about Freddy Krueger this you know child killer because like true crime is like all the rage and so (laughs) you go into it from that angle of like i love true crime wait there's a true crime story i there was a serial killer in my town on my street like what what's the deal what 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 you know tell me everything about this guy and as they're finding out stuff about freddy krueger that's when he starts invading their dreams because they're thinking about him and they weren't before but as they start thinking about him, that's when he starts gaining power and then, you know, that's, invading the dreams. That's very cool. Right. The, I mean, especially because the, when did the original come out? Like the 80s or something? 84. And then the remake was 2010. The reason why I mention is because like 84, this being a secret is definitely something that would have happened in the 80s. In a modern yeah. world, like, oh, this killer disappears or this killer was killed. That would be like news right and like even kids will occasionally google their own name or will google their parents name if all of a sudden they get linked to this article from five ten years ago where like their parents names are in this list of people who may be murdered this right this serial killer yeah like in the uh like in the in the in the context of the in the film it's seen as like this whole generation of the town it's like their shame and they don't talk about it because they're deep down they're ashamed of what they did that they Mm -hmm murdered Fred Krueger and took the law into their own hands. It's like blood on their hands and stuff. And I think right now in this moment in, in 2021, so many small towns in America are like reckoning with their dark pasts Mm -hmm. and the horrifying stuff that has happened in our towns, our hometowns. And And if you find that as a concept interesting, then write to slam dance and tell them to really support this movie called stuck, (laughs) which is in the quarterfinals. Okay. Oh, is that? Yeah, yeah. Or even like <laughs> yeah. if S, like uh, like S Town, uh huh. Yeah, you know, like a, like a podcast of like the town of Elmwood is exposed and like yeah. all this shit's coming to light, and the kids are at high school being like, oh, I can't believe our parents. We would never do that. Like, 
Right. It's, cool I mean, it's also the concept behind Runaways or the Stargirl TV show that was on uh, DC Universe. I think that it there's an interesting there's a really interesting place that you can take this character now and this concept now um, specifically about his origin. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with the dream stuff and like Freddy's powers. Um, and you can set, certainly do really inventive kills. But I also think one of the mistakes that the remake did was try to make Freddy scary again, because at a certain point he had gotten so camp that like, that was, you know, Robert England's take well, on the yeah. character. Yeah. Because <laughs> un unlike Michael Myers or Jason, Freddie can talk. Right. And Freddie has catchphrases. And, yeah. and so he became quips. kind of quips. <laughs> so he almost became like a Bugs Bunny Deadpool character where you'd be rooting for him when he shows up and wanting him to kill the teenagers. Right. And, you know, that's not really conducive to horror at, right. at a certain point. Right. But I think they went too far in the direction of trying to make him scary again but like he ended up just kind of being lame jackie earl haley played him in the remake it was kind um, of devoid of personality yeah he was rorschach in the watchman movie oh um, yeah uh, <laughs> the pitcher in bad news bears <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> what, a, what a career and he uh it he still had quips but they were like but he like growled them Mm -hmm. which just like made them it just made them feel weird i don't know like it just it's like you're not funny but you're trying to be funny but you're not really scary either because you're not trying to be scary you're trying to be funny mm -hmm. like so it just becomes this mishmash of vibes that like yeah. was trying to have its cake and eat it so are, are the quips important like is that a defining characteristic for freddy krueger as we know him like do you want quips in your version of the movie uh, and my version, Freddy's sense of humor does find a way into my new iteration of the character that I okay. came up with and I'm excited about. Okay, tell us about it. Yeah. So I went pretty out there. I kind of wasn't interested because I was so bored by the... I remember being so bored by the remake that I was like, fucking town and Nancy and I don't want to <laughs> do any of that. So like, I came up with something pretty and I'm down to like jettison it and follow Scott's thread. Um, <laughs> but That's why so, you two work well together. <laughs> so like <laughs> I had this like idea of a cold open mm -hmm. where it was like right before, like a couple of years before the civil war, like visually imagine like little women era Dickinson era, you know? Yeah. And it's uh, a little kid is having like a nightmare and it's like storming outside. And the, uh, the mom is at the bedside and it's like, Oh, it's okay. It's just like, no, no, there's a monster in my closet. There's a monster in my closet. And it's like, be, you know, remember what Nanny Freddie always says, you have to be brave. <laughs> Isn't that what Nanny Freddie says to be brave? And she's okay, I'll be brave. Like, okay. Remember there's no monster in your closet. Kid goes to sleep. You know, parent goes, leaves the room. And then you hear from the closet, a woman's voice being like, Billy, Billy. And like, Danny, Freddie, what are you doing in my closet? Like, get in here. The monster's not in the closet. It's under your bed. You have to come hide with me. Like, oh, okay. Runs and she, the kid's in the closet. And it's like, where are you? Where are you? And then like lightning strikes. And you see a silhouette of a woman in like a, like a 19th century, like Amelia Bedelia, like dress. Mm. And she has like this big, like Cheshire smile. And she raises her hand and she has the iconic Fred Krueger claw. Uh-huh. And you just see like a slash and the screen goes red. And so my version of Freddy Krueger, F-R-E-D-D-I-E, -D -D -E, is um, this legendary, this legend of this like nanny who would be like the sweetest nanny to all the little kids. But then at night they would have these horrible nightmares. And she became known as the nightmare nanny. And oh. when there were a few child deaths, this town was like, she's a witch. And it turns out she was this like well-to-do aristocrat, like the daughter of this really wealthy family that had like the nicest house on Elm Street. And but when they find out that Freddie's a witch, they like chase her down into the cellar of this house and they burn the house down. And now the house has been like condemned. But like that's where like Freddie's soul is like haunts. Huh. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. That, that's a really, really cool uh, reimagining for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I really like that. Yeah, uh, I do too. Yeah. I mean, my thought was a sort of, I was going to take the child part out of the equation and I was going mm -hmm. to have him be a sort of like Ted Bundy type of like 
okay. like a, attractive guy who like goes out and then like gets teen girls and kills them. And is there like so, records of him, like Ted Bundy, of like you can go and rack and read interviews of him and how yeah, smart he was? I, okay. I, like I think that's the kind of vibe is like it, for sure for me was like that kind of vibe. Just because, but I, you know, it's, it's a thing where it's like, do you go urban legend territory or do you go true crime territory? Because either way you can read, that's the thing. That's the great thing about Nightmare on Elm Street is like, you can literally <laughs> go both directions and you would be not wrong to go in either direction, which I right. think is that's, really that's cool. so crazy. Yeah. I kind of went for this like conjuring nightmare, Tim Burton vibe. And you went for like, like Zodiac true crime, Ted Bundy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fred, Fred Krueger. Right, right. My my thought was that he was going to be a teacher. That 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 oh, you were going to find cool. out that he was a teacher at the high school, and yeah. was like, everyone thought that he like slept with the students, but he didn't. He was killing them. Yeah. Killing oh, kids. I hate even bringing this up because it's so uh, such a bummer. But you know, like like Stanley Tucci's character in The Lovely Bones, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, he was this weird guy in the town, but we never thought he was like that fucked up. Right. Right. But yeah, I don't know. I yours is really cool too. It's it's like, <laughs> but that's the thing is like it's just a totally different thing. Um, the 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 uh, if it were me, I would potentially at lean more towards Nick's idea. A because we like that sort of story kind of already gives us a sense of the supernatural as opposed to Scott's story where we kind of already have that true crime sense. And that doesn't necessarily immediately trigger supernatural in my brain. That doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing. But also like the creepy babysitter that kills children, mm -hmm. like that feels, that feels like a legend and a story behind it. And that feels like we could then turn around and have that person be fun as opposed to, as opposed to the charming teacher who kills teenagers. Well, Scott, I have a question for you. Do you did you have a Kruger in mind in your version? Uh, Glenn Howerton. Oh, so yeah, that's because like, oh man, like, because like, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Howerton's character, Dennis, is slowly, season by season, year after year, piece by piece, revealing more of himself. And he could very well be a serial killer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? And it's wow. one of the greatest long game performances in television history, where he just has these, he's such an incredible actor. And in that show, he's using that for like this comedy. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a moment where he's like, like he threatens to like, like, like skin his sister D. And it's like, do you think you're gonna skin? Like, no, because of the smell. You haven't thought of the smell, you bitch. And <laughs> like, <laughs> so like that's yeah. per pitch perfect casting because like yeah, just tapes and tapes of him rambling in prison about Kruger's like manifesto or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah. The 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 Glenn Howerton thing for me, like I, all of what you just said, but then it was also just like my thought of like he's a really handsome looking guy, and like mm -hmm. you would never believe that he was the serial killer. And so like my my thought process was like when the parents kill him, they all sort of blame themselves for not seeing through his deception. Right. Okay. Whereas like Jackie Earl Haley, he's like a fucking creepy gardener who's like constantly like petting the children. <laughs> and, and like everyone's like, we just didn't see it coming. I was like, really? You didn't see that coming? Seriously? <laughs> um, you know, and I, so it was just it's very obtuse. Whereas like I wanted a, a Fred a Freddy that was like charming. Yeah, because I was Ted Bundy's like, you right. know, you, you over and over people like he had a face that scientifically you were more inclined to believe and be vulnerable around. Right. Than right. like someone who looked creepy. Right. Uh, I, Sam, I, I apologize. I know we normally do casting like in its own section. That's um, all right. It, this is an important I'm, I'm part because we're we're <laughs> yeah. we're doing totally different genders. That's true. Yeah, so, you gotta, that's a very you gotta, important thing. You gotta figure out what movie we're making first. So yeah. my who, my who did you have as the nanny? Uh yeah. my top choice for Freddy Krueger, the nightmare nanny, is uh Samara Weaving. Whoa, very young. Wow. Yeah, because she would have been like the pretty dream nanny. That's of like true. almost like Mary Poppins where you're like, she is so perfect. I can't believe it. And then she has that like smile. There's this moment in like ready or not. And in all of her movies where she just has this like Chelsea smile. I think a lot of people are like, Oh, she should have played Harley Quinn or, and sure. so, so, you know, Freddy Krueger just kind of taunts you like, Hey bitch, you know, like that, that's, you know, not far off the mark, you know? Right. And so I like the idea of this Freddy, like kind of taunting slash teasing you and being like, 
like a demented kind of Mary Poppins, but still having that like pitch black Freddy Krueger sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, Samara weaving with the, the Freddy Krueger claw in like wow. a 19th century like dress. That's, I mean, it's a hard image to shake. I like, <laughs> I really like that a lot. Thank um, you. Yeah. So what is her, what is her deal? Like, why is she doing this? So um, I kind of created this like haunting of Hill House, like uh, like House on a Haunted Hill, where it's like this college movie where these college students have been brought to this to the Kruger house and th oh. the professor is like I'm brought I brought you all here over the weekend and we're going to do like sleep study dream study and if you stay the whole weekend you can leave it any time you want but if you stay the whole weekend you get a credit taken care of like oh. you just get a free you know invest it when you don't you don't have to take one of those shitty comm classes at eight in the morning you right. know yeah and so it's this like collection of eccentric college students that have all been gathered together and they're wandering like this stately manner because the Krugers were like really rich and it's just like a haunted house nightmare on Elm Street movie. I the thing that I love about this is it's very obvious which of us watched the original movie and which of us <laughs> watched the third movie. Because, yeah for sure. Because like, <laughs> like that's the third like the third movie uh uh, uh Sam it, it takes place in a mental hospital and it's a bunch yes. of teenagers in a mental hospital like it's very new mutants you know the new mm -hmm. mutants the they they like is, band is together of like you know what fuck this guy we're gonna band together and take him down. Yeah and uh the other We're gonna movie, make it's kind of a funny story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Zach Galifianakis is like the nurse, uh, <laughs> and then it's also kind of ripping off uh, the second one, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Two, because that one is about Freddy's trying to possess a boy mm -hmm. that lives in Nancy's ho old house to try and actually be on Earth and be able to kill on like while people while they're awake. So he's like trying to possess, and that is Freddy's my Freddy's super objective in this movie is the protagonist, the lead girl in my movie. She's like trying to possess her or like get her to like. There's this one sequence I have an idea where she's like exploring the house. The protagonist, her name's Josie, and uh, you hear like a a clinking, like like claws clinking on against a surface. Yeah, uh, and then she's like wandering, and then she comes into a room, and it's this like dollhouse. And you, she, and it's the clinking, clicking is coming from the dollhouse. And she reaches in, and Josie, she pulls out the Kruger glove, and mm. like, and then Freddie's voice is like, "Try it on, Josie. Like, put it on," which is like something that happens in two. <laughs> yeah. So for for Nick, my my follow up question is, how is the teacher who brought them to that house connected to Freddy Krueger? He's like, uh, he's like one of those professors that's really just there to push his own career and like get stuff published and like you know use his students as like cannon fodder basically mm -hmm. so he's convinced that he can do some kind of like do can places really trigger traumatic nightmares and memories can places really hold that kind of power let's let's spend a weekend in the kruger house where this like horrible thing happened so mm -hmm. he is uh using the kids as bait to try to study the ghost yeah, to see like what happens. And then the kids start okay. getting picked off one by one. My potential uh, change to that would make him be the one kid that, like, I know that you, like, I, I you said it in like a Victorian times, but like, oh, like a descendant. To, like, yeah. Like, this is the one kid that like survived. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they survive because they continually offer other people to the oh, ghost. Oh, that's cool. And that's how they're able to stay alive. Right. And so the teacher needs these kids to be killed because otherwise she'll kill him. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. See, I was going to say, I was going to say he's like, he's like her Van Helsing is what I was going to say. I'm oh, like, like she's trying to take him down. Yeah. He's, he's like, down. he's like setting this up to like lure her out so that he can, he's just like, yeah, like you yeah. killed all my friends, you bitch. I kind of feel like can... the other option is that he's just in love with her. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And like a Ted, I kind of feel like we can well, consolidate both of your ideas into well, it's like, also just, like, like a reverse, uh, a reverse Harley Quinn. Mm. Uh, yeah. 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 True. Yeah. I like that. It's personal though. And not just like he wants to be famous or get something published. I think that's a stronger choice for sure. It's a, well, and it's a, it's a good, it's a good, um, like one to one with like the parents reveal like we killed Fred Krueger. Mm. You're you don't have that in your version. Right, so this yeah. could be the equivalent of that big reveal 
of yeah. like, actually, she does this every once in a while. I survived the last round and I'm here for revenge. Oh, hell yeah. Like, yeah, it's like one of those curses, like every 70 years, this has to happen. Yeah. Or else she'll escape or something, yeah. you know, or she'll kill me. Right. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So then so, jumping back over to Scott's version. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, see, my, yo, go ahead. Go ahead. No, keep going. No, what were you going to ask? I was going to say, talk to me about what's happening. So, like, it sounds like it's just this evil, this evil teacher, this charismatic teacher who's going around killing people. And that that's why he was eventually taken down. Right. So now what's happening, That that's what's happened in the past. So now what's happening in your version of the present? So in my version of the present, um, my Nancy is a... Uh, a, a murderino, a, a true crime enthusiast. That's what they're called as murderinos. God, I did um, not know that. Yep. I just, uh, I thought, I thought we were going real, uh, 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 90s. Yeah. Ned, Ned Flanders over here. <laughs> oh, no, right, that comes, too. Yeah. It comes from <laughs> a lot of Simpsons references in this episode. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, we my could favorite talking- murder. We could talk yeah. about the shinning, but it no. comes, uh, yeah, it comes from the po- put a pin in that, Sam. <laughs> I, I almost referenced the shinning because I was I was going to say that that the 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 Nightmare on Elm Street episode is as close to Nightmare on Elm Street as the shinning is to the shining. Right, anyway, it's kind of like an quiet. Over- Do you want to get yeah. sued? <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, Murderino. It comes from a podcast called My Favorite Murder, which is a true crime podcast. Got um, it. Anyway. So she is a like murderino. She reads books on serial killers and things, but you know, the reason that she does it is much like the reason that uh, my fiance does it is it, it, it calms her anxiety about being killed by someone because she's reading like, okay, how did he do it? How did it work? Okay. So I know to look out for these signs and these things. And so like, it's all coming from that perspective. And she has like this respect for, the for his victims and and she like maybe she even has a true crime podcast but she's very much a lot more active um in terms of the type of character that she is and when she finds out about fred krueger you know there is a sense of a cover-up in this town because this town doesn't want to be known (laughs) as the town where Fred Krueger came from. But, you know, it's a cover-up in so much as, like, nobody talks about it. But, like, you can look up a newspaper and find it, you know? Right. You know, maybe she was... And, like, so, so yeah. So she finds out about this Fred Krueger legend or, you know, this this true crime story and reads up on it and she starts telling her friends about it and they're just like, that's really creepy. And then they all start having the nightmares. Nice. Um, and, and... The nightmares of like, and she's like, I'm having nightmares about Fred Krueger. And her parents are just like, we fucking told you to stop reading about murders and shit. You like dumb idiot. Of course you're having nightmares. And so that's where like the gaslighting part of it comes from, because that's a major part of the Nightmare on Elm Street saga is that no one believes them that they're being hurt in their dreams or that Mm -hmm. any of this could possibly be real. People have bad dreams. Like, mm. that's a thing. And, and so when they start bringing up Fred Krueger, the town is like, shut up, you know, hands over the ears. We don't right. talk about it. We don't face it. And the children suffer. Right, right. Got it. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And so, like, that's that's my thought process. Because I think the way that he was killed is, like, he was arrested and was, and they're like, if we get this guy in front of TV cameras... He's going to be able to talk his way out of this. He's so this. charming. He's so he, handsome. Yeah. yeah. He's so charming. Like it, it's, it's going to be bad. We need to do something. And one of the parents is a sheriff, just like he is in the original film. And he's like, okay, we're going to do a prisoner transfer. And in the prisoner transfer, we're not going to take him to the next prison. He's going to die in an accident on the yeah. way there. It's like a conspiracy. Um, yeah. It's a whole ah. conspiracy thing. Um, and, and so that's, that w- that's what the cabal of parents is. It is. It's more of like an agreement than like them all standing there with torches and pitchforks, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, it's like a conspiracy, which I think is uh, a little more of a modern approach to it. And then the idea of like, wow, we had a serial killer in this town. He was never proven guilty because mm-hmm. he never got that far. And so, but then he just like died in an accident. Wow, that's convenient. And like, hey, weren't you the deputy dad at the time when this <laughs> no. happened? You know? Yeah. So it's like it's it's a lot of that. It's like them unraveling this conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And 
like the person, the prison bus driver talks or right. like, I can't keep it inside anymore. I got to tell somebody. And I think that at first, again, because he's this charming, charismatic guy, you know, Freddy Krueger is scary in these, in the dreams, but like, is also being like, Oh, Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know? And like trying to like, Oh, woe is me. Pity me. And he's actually making these kids think that he was innocent and that he didn't oh, do anything. Cool. Yeah. Oh. And so they're starting to believe it. And then like over the course of the movie, they realize like, Oh no, their parents were totally right. People would have bought that he was innocent yeah. and that he didn't do this. It's like, he's one of those guys that, Unfortunately, it's kind of almost a trope in these true crime stories where it's like the guy who just keeps getting away with life. Yep. And it's like always just skirts through accidents and disappearances. You know, Robert yeah. Durst. Yeah, Robert, Robert yeah. Durst. Or well, and and he's rich. I like to compare oh, okay. I like to like compare like Ted Bundy, who got away like three or four times. Like legitimately right, like, got away, where people are like, ah, he's fine, just let him go. He didn't like do blue it. Blue collar. Yeah. Like th that reminds me of uh Aber Abernail, right? Catch me if you can. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. That kind like, of vibe. Yeah, because Glenn Howard, and if you watch like AP Bio or Sonny, he's just he, he's great at playing characters that can just talk their way out of anything. And like weasel their way out of stuff, but still be like <laughs> charming. And to use that charm for horror could be really yeah. fun. Yeah. So that's where yeah. I'm at. Yeah. So then, so then Nick for uh -huh. the, uh, the, the haunted house <laughs> angle. Nanny Freddie, how, yeah. how do the kids take her down? Like, well, that's the or, thing. So, or do they? Yeah. So I kind of have like, I have characters and I have set pieces of like, you know, basically what their nightmare would be, how they would die. But then, I have like the idea of there being like a final two. There's Josie, our protagonist, and this guy named Tyler that's struggling with like, he's like, he's dealing with his own masculinity and his own like anger and darkness in kind of a Jack Torrin shining way where his nightmare is he's afraid of himself going on a rampage. And so Freddie is like, ooh, I actually might want to possess you instead. So she's having this like cat and mouse game where she's trying to figure out who to possess while they're like fighting her. Mm -hmm. And because it's a horror movie, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, I'm a sweetheart when I'm a writer. I don't like hurting my characters. I don't like sad <laughs> endings, but with horror, you kind of had this carte blanche, like, no, like the bad thing can happen. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually does end with Josie getting like, she survives, but she's possessed mm -hmm. and is now carrying the spirit of Fred Krueger with her. And now Fred Krueger isn't confined to the house anymore. It's like can she can wreak havoc on the world because yeah. she's like the, the spirit. The house was like keeping her spirit locked in. Like wow. my, so, so so the kills are connected to what these kids' recurring nightmares had been. Yeah, like Freddie can like look into their subconscious and be like, oh, like you're afraid of heights. You're afraid of swimming. So, so then, this, what is Josie's recurring nightmare? So uh, actually, she's one of the few ones that I don't really have one for, like a uh, what's what I'm a gimmick, I guess, for lack of a better term. But she's like recovering from a mental breakdown. She has spent some time in like a mental hospital and is now living at, in college, like with regular kids. And so, so it she's, sounds like something that would freak her out would be losing control like that again. So like a yeah, lack for of sure. Control. Well, she and like a lack of control of reality. I think that's something really scary that I've dealt with with my own mental illness is like the idea of not being able to trust your own mind or your own instincts mm -hmm. of like being scared, sitting in a room by yourself has Got been it. scary for me sometimes that I've had to like deal with my own little traps that I set for myself. But yeah. So, and like, as she's kind of surviving, all of, all of these kids are getting picked off, but she isn't. And Freddie is like luring her to find the claw and like, oh, I, like your idea, Scott, kind of sympathizing with her of like, they, they burn me alive. Like, can you, you know, don't you want to help me? You know? And she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it makes sense in my head if all the other kids, like their fears eventually would culminate in an eventual death. But her yeah. fear is not death. It's, it, it's living, but, but separate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like, and like that her nightmare kind of comes true where she now does have something in her that she can't control. Yeah. You know, and now she can like go off anywhere and have Nightmare on Elm Street adventures. That's cool. I like it. So Scott, uh -huh. <laughs> how do, uh, how do the kids beat the charismatic teacher? So, so, um, for, for me, it's, it's them sort of unraveling this con conspiracy involving their parents. And, you know, I think that 
when he's trying to sympathize with them, it might not necessarily be on a personal level. It might be of just like showing them things that like could be construed in a way that are sympathetic of like, Oh, he just really loved his students. And like, mm -hmm. you know, like things like that. Cause you know, he's manipulating these dreams himself. Mm -hmm. He was a weirdo. They never liked him. <laughs> yeah. But then as, as the kids start getting picked off in, in the dreams, as he's like, ramping up power because at a certain point he can only get so powerful with people knowing who he is he ha they have to be scared of him right mm -hmm. and so he starts picking them off and she knowing all of these sort of like tropes of serial killers and like the things that they do like you know he is manipulating all of them in the very similar ways like like nick was saying of like you know they're afraid of certain things and there's usually like some sort of thematic thing going on with the way that he kills them that has to do with their 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 worst nightmares right and and the way that the franchise usually does nightmares is like nick said like whatever their worst fear is he turns that into their worst nightmare and i i think that mixed with surrealism could be a really cool way to kill all these people but then when it comes down to nancy and she's the last one left the big reveal for her is like at this point she has put together one they've unraveled the conspiracy and she's put together that oh wait he did do it and my parents were right to kill him mm -hmm. and he's killing all of my friends in my dreams in 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 their dreams um and so she when she goes in and is like you know maybe one of her one of her other friends was like telling her like yeah it was like living my worst nightmare and so she was like thinking about like what her worst nightmare is but like she's a murderino her worst nightmare is being killed by a serial killer and so she goes mm -hmm. in and she basically takes away all of his surrealism and he's just stripped back down to being oh, a serial wow. killer and she knows wow. how to outsmart that because of everything that she knows about true crime and being a murderino Ah, she, that's she's, great. She's able to overcome. Yeah, she's yeah. been building her own arm. She's been preparing for this without realizing it her whole life. Exactly. Exactly. That I'm going to reference comics again. It's what I picture is the moment in Red Sun where we meet Hal Jordan, who's been in prison for 15 years, and he's like been brick by brick building a prison in his head to to imprison his captors. Mm hmm. And it's yeah. just like she's been constructing this thing in her head for years and years and years. And yeah. it goes and it goes back to what you were saying about like, you know, like the the comfort food angle of this. That, that might be the wrong term. But yeah, like, you know, a thing is less scary the more you understand it, mm -hmm. whether it's like, you know, natural disasters or, you know, you know, people will research and like to help overcome stuff so it isn't in the abstract anymore right so like, she's created this very strict prison that he's stuck in where he's like just a human right and right. it becomes like this other kind of thrilling thing of like two humans chasing each other which can be really scary yeah that's yeah. awesome so, so if i were to because obviously we now have two movies and i don't know what to do, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but if i were to go and like kind of consolidate your two things scott i think i would call yours um Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. um, but Nick, I think I would call yours Nightmare of Elm Street. Ooh. Ooh. Or Nightmare at Elm House. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. But like, you, like, because theoretically, like, this is a thing, like, the, uh, in Scots, it's a serial killer. It's this thing that happened here. It was on our streets. Mm -hmm. As opposed to this is just a specter and a creep who is, like, right. who is the creep and specter of, of this yeah. area. I like yeah. that. That's awesome. Nightmare of Elm Street. Yeah. I have no idea uh, what I'm going to call this episode. I mean, whoever's listening will already know, but still. A Nightmare on Elm Street, the Nightmare of Elm Street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Colon. I'm just yeah. imagining a marketing exec looking at that on a poster. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It's this huge. is way more complicated than just putting an S at the end. It's bigger than extremely <laughs> loud and incredibly close. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly close and, and, and surprisingly loud. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so then, I mean, we kind of have a sense of, like, the plot of your movies, but in mm -hmm. terms of, like, set pieces and style, yeah, I yeah. guess that's getting more into director, but, like, uh, before we get to how you're casting, because I think at this point we're just going to have two separate movies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Talk to me about, <laughs> I don't know, it just happened that way, and I leaned yeah. into it. <laughs> talk, to, talk to me about the way your dream worlds look. Mm. Are they going to be different for each person whose dream we're in? Like, it's a different... Sur like if this one's surrealist this one's like 
art deco this one's whatever yeah for mine is really like looking back through my notes it really is like an amuse bouche like sampler platter of like all the different kinds of things you can do with elm street mm -hmm. like you got just straight up surreal nightmare imagery um but then you have like subtle oh my god like i didn't realize i was having a nightmare at first you know mm -hmm. Or like <laughs> the kind of different ways you can be scared or disoriented in a dream. I had kind of fun like looking at different points of attack for those. Tell us. So for example, I have this, uh, so like there's this character named Olivia that I'm picturing being the really nice kind of sweet, the first one to go over and talk to Josie and be like, this is crazy, right? Like, oh man. And we're like, oh cool, they're going to be friends. And then she's <laughs> goes off by herself for horror movie reasons. And she, oh no, you know what? She should be like taking a bath because- she is suddenly in this dream where she's back with her mom doing swimming lessons. Mm, and gosh. she she was like afraid of going underwater. And the mom had to be like, you have to go underwater. There's only one way to face your fear. And then the mom like becomes Freddy and like holds her underwater and drowns her. Mm -hmm. And like, or maybe something like comes out from under the pool to grab her leg, like Freddy's arms or a tentacle or something. Because mm -hmm. that's another nightmare is getting dragged down to the bottom of a pool. Sure. And so they're like banging on the door back in the real world because there's like water seeping from under her bedroom door. And then finally they open it and like the shining but water, just this torrent of water shoots out and she's like drowned. Yeah. Cool. That's good. Yeah. I like yeah. that the surrealism can come through into the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like little artifacts or remnants. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. Especially because if you do a kill that way, like I, I like the idea of like water seeping out under the door. They open the door, water pours out. And mm -hmm. then when they finally manage to get back in, she's drowned, but the rest of the room is bone dry. Mm. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Cause that is kind of the weird rules is that like the cuts, the injuries stay. Right. You know, but then like, yeah, the world does kind of like return to normal. It fades like a dream, like the memory of a dream. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like as you're like, oh, I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, like I have this one, cause another fear that I have is heights. I'm not good with like heights, but I'm also not, I'm like, I get kind of like vertigo sometimes of like, like, whoa, like how when you're being high up or you look down. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so I had this idea of this one character, Ruben, he's kind of like the, the comic relief. Like I'm just here for an easy credit. I'm the fun guy, you know? <laughs> and he's like, in a garage, and this is the Nolan level, like the Chris Nolan sequence, because the idea is that the ground is tilting, so he's disoriented, but it's also getting higher and higher up. And it's like the building is like making him try, trying to make him fall as he's running. And so it's like scary Chris Nolan. Cool. I like it. I, I, I like that because that's kind of what I want. Because again, what I talked about at the beginning is that everyone's concept of dreaming is different. Mm -hmm. And for a movie like this, not that I have any say, it's your, it's your two <laughs> decisions. But, like, I, I think it's important that every dream is so different as, like, indicative of the person who's having it. Just kind of, like, we see this little glimpse into how they think. Not for very long, they're about to die. Mm -hmm. But but we got a sense of who they were just based on, like, their concept of what, an, in like, a weird world. And I like the idea of the surrealist brain, the Christopher Nolan brain. Mm -hmm. Right, the, like how they just think. Just the uncanny valley brain. Oh, right, yeah, like someone's faces are weird. <laughs> yeah, they're just, yeah. they're slightly, like, like it starts normal, but faces just start getting slightly more off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More plastic. Kind of letting the audience find the scare. That's always fun. Yeah. Just finding the couple people who, like, I don't get it. Just, they're the face blind people. Mm -hmm. And then they hear someone scream. You hear someone scream behind you in the theater. And you're like, what? What did they see? I didn't see anything. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that. I like that. Scott, uh, for the more grounded podcast version of this movie yeah Tell, like what what did you envision for the dreams when you were thinking about it well so so my my thought process with the dreams was like especially the first one which i think would be the most important is a sense of like or i guess the first kill not the first dream because obviously there's dreams earlier where he's trying to like make them believe that he was wrongly accused and that yeah. their pa parents killed them for no killed him for no reason. But uh, the first dream where he kills one of the kids, I think is I want it to sort of escalate in a way that like, I would imagine a serial killer would escalate a situation, right? So like mm. you have people, you have characters like, or not characters or real, real people. You have real killers. Like, you know, you're Jack the Ripper who like would literally just come out of the shadows kill a sex worker, leave, Disappear. right? Yeah. Disappear into the shadows. And 
but I don't think that's not how most serial killers operate, right? Most serial killers aren't like your Buffalo Bills. Most of them are people that you trust and betray that trust and kill you. And so uh, what I want is something that is like a dream that is like a very pleasant dream and then he's a part of it and then it starts to turn and he escalates things and like puts on the glove and the glove is like that was his murder weapon when he was alive that's what he used it's like his like you know uh, it's kind of it's the difference the between a tactile. thriller mm -hmm. yeah like this is like because like uh, you know that there's a famous hitchcock quote about like knowing that there's a bomb under the table versus not knowing right and like the audience is like so like shaking of in their seats of like don't trust him stop talking to him like is way ahead of the audience remember like get out of there Right. And then slowly it dawns on them that they're in a room with like, you know, this, this evil character. Right. And then I think the way that like, you know, the way that you, that, that, that a serial killer would like, you know, like I'm thinking about like Patrick Bateman, right. In American psycho. Mm -hmm. um, and he had to and top the, himself. Right. And like, he would top himself each time and, and he would act really friendly and then like turn a corner. And like, sometimes it would be like a sudden like crazy burst of violence, but other times it would be a slow descent into violence. And that's sort of how I picture this is this slow descent. And then just like a drop into just crazy town. Um, in right. terms now, Patrick of like, Baden, at certain point, he just stops caring if he gets caught and stops right. trying to be subtle and just, Right, exactly. And you just, you know, like I think about that scene where the sex workers are trying to leave his apartment and he's watching them go down the stairs and he just takes the chainsaw and just like drops it on them from the top of the stairs. Like I just think about like stuff like that. And I think about like Freddie being that kind of killer, like that yeah, kind like of like the, the level of disconnect. Yeah. Cruelty that he's just playing with them and right. Like playing with his own like imagine like what if I did this and not even scared of like, oh, what if I get caught? Right, right. So so my take on your version of the dreams is that your versions of dreams are like almost all monkey paws. Mm. In that like it instead of building off of their fears, which is what happens uh, in the yeah. next story, it's yeah. you're building off of their desires, their wishes, like what mm. these kids want. And right. then as you like they grow to trust him more and more, that gets subverted and it's the thing that they wanted, the thing that they believed is what actually kills them. Mm -hmm. Like if a person was dreaming about like being the lead in the school play or going on a date with their crush or reuniting with a dead grandparent or parent. Right. Like luring them in with that. Yeah. 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 I think lure, lure, definitely luring them into with that. And then, but then, you know, the turn happens and it's, I don't know that monkey paw is exactly the right thing. Cause it's not like an ironic, but thing. Okay. Yeah. Then how about, then how about anglerfish? <laughs> <Anglerfish>. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, all right yeah i think little, it's a yeah. ceiling light with the bait yeah. yeah right yeah exactly that's yeah, more of what i'm thinking of okay yeah. great yeah. i like it yeah um, i can, can you imagine just uh a, a, an angler fish with just like a little light and then you look in its mouth and all the teeth are just the, the hands with the thing the, the finger oh that'd hands. be yeah. crazy yeah. all over someone's yeah. afraid of angler fish <laughs> or they're just they're just afraid of like the ocean oh yeah oh, that's a real sure. thing yeah yeah yeah, the depths absolutely. we don't know what's yeah. down there uh, anyway there, there's a lot of people who like almost drown once when they're a kid and just like any large body of water because like you don't know sure. what's hiding yeah yeah, and yeah. Then all of a sudden a little green and red striped angler fish comes out and... <laughs> a little little sweater and a hat <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, can you an angler fish in a hat <laughs> you're a long way down bitch <laughs> <laughs> down the gullet <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, cool. I like it. All right. I think we kind of have both your movies. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. I want to kind of, I'll go into kind of individual stuff with characters as we get into character stuff. Because mm -hmm. I just have like a little brief like, oh, here's what I think would happen to them, you know? Yeah. Well, one one bit that I, I forgot to mention, um, I brought it up in the rundown of like the actual, the original plot of the original film. But like the um, Freddy inadvertently i don't think he does it on purpose he never says that he does it on purpose inadvertently uh framing their friend for the murder of his girlfriend right that oh yeah yeah thing. it's like um, an afterthought almost right like, oh okay cool what what i what i like about it in this version of the story is that the parents are like immediately like oh no it's happening again we have another serial killer mm, in this yeah. town and so they're like 
more gung ho about getting this guy. But the thing that I want to change about Glenn or not Glenn, what is his name? Glenn is uh, the other oh, Johnny Depp's character. Rod Rod's character, um, okay. who is the guy who gets blamed for um, killing Tina. Rod in this is very like macho, like bully, mm. dickhead guy. Easier and, to believe. Yeah, and I want I want this guy to be their gay friend, like where he was just at her house because she was scared of the nightmares and is like, well, let's just have a sleepover, you know, like whatever, like we'll watch movies. And mm -hmm. then she just falls asleep while they're watching the movie. And he just, she just gets sliced and diced and he's like, Oh my God, what the, and then like, so it's just so unbelievable that this guy like <laughs> serial killed this girl. Um, and, <laughs> and it's only Nancy that is like, no, none of this makes sense. And all mm -hmm. of the cops are like, they are like you re hear about in all these true crime documentaries. They're just like, yeah, no, of course he did it. Of course he was the only one. There. Sure. They're always, they're always looking for the least amount of work possible. Let's right. wrap this up so we can get right. back to doing nothing. And so only Nancy believes him that he didn't do it because he's, she's like, there's no way. Like he's I'm looking at the evidence. Like so, so are the parents gearing up to to kill this the the kid yes, too? I think so. Are yeah. they going to do it? I think that they. I think that they are going to, but Freddie gets to him first. All right. Uh, okay. Cool. Interesting. Yeah. They, they they get they open the door and he's already like dead and they're like what? yeah yeah cool so, that's cool yeah. that's very creepy yeah all right cool I. I don't know what else to do except hear uh, how you guys are painting this world with your cast. <laughs> For sure. Your worlds uh, with your cast. Do you, how do you want to do you want to do like all of us? Like I just do all of mine and then you do all of yours or like back and forth. We can do it that way. Let's do it that way. Since we have different characters. Okay. So we'll do back and forth. Yeah. Okay. I'll start with, so I started with Samara weaving as Freddy Krueger, um, the nightmare nanny Yes. for the role of Dr. Saxon the uh the college professor that's lured everyone down to the to, to the house uh returning to the nightmare on elm street franchise after 30 years mr lawrence fishburne oh shit Ooh. that's good uh, i for i forgot about that yeah. connection too I was like, oh that's that's right he's already been in one of these because i just yeah. like it yeah that's great no i love that <laughs> i think that's a, that's a lot of fun yeah that's two huge actors that got their start in a nightmare on Elm street movie. Cause you have literally you have the credit and introducing Johnny Depp in a nightmare mm -hmm. on Elm street. And then you have, you have Larry, Larry Fishburne. Fishburne. Yeah. Not even Lawrence yet. <laughs> in nightmare wow. on Elm street to three. <laughs> That's like when you see uh, uh James Carey in, in living color. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. He looks like 16. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you want to do what do you want to just go down the line, Scott? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Uh, for my lead, uh, Josie, the like kind of dorky protagonist who's like kind of shy and awkward. I have an actress named Helena Howard. Uh, the only thing I've seen her in, she doesn't have, she's like really new. Uh, she was in a movie called Madeline's Madeline. That was one of my favorite movies in the year that it came out. It was like 2018. And she just, it was like a really memorable performance. And she also played a character that was very like mentally fragile on the edge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my, she's also in an Amazon prime show called the wilds apparently where it's about a bunch of girls that are stranded on an Island. So I'm glad she's staying paid. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, she was also in deeper. So, which means she was uh, the poster on bus stops around Los Angeles for months. Oh, sweet. I haven't heard of that one either. Deeper. <laughs> I only know of it because of the signs. Yeah, no, for sure. I, that's, that's a real LA thing of like, there's that sign again. I've, I don't know what it's for. Yep. Like La Brea. There's this thing called La Brea. I have no idea what it is, but I've seen the billboards. <laughs> Playing Olivia, the nice girl who gets dr drowned. Uh, I have Hunter Schaefer, most well-known from Euphoria. She's mm. uh, an incredible actress. She, uh, her like Euphoria special that really centered on her character was like some of the best TV I've seen in a while. And it would be kind of a stunt cast. So she's kind of like, oh my God, Hunter Schaefer from Euphoria. And then she's like the second person to die. And like that kind of be like a jostling moment. Cool. Um, for Austin, the nice guy with the dark side that Freddie almost possesses. I have an actor named Tyler Alvarez who, uh, have either of you seen the show American Vandal on Netflix? Uh, I've seen a couple episodes. Okay. Yes. Uh, for sure, Scott. Uh, yeah, and, and Sam Tyler is like the lead filmmaker character with the glasses who gets like oh, the audience. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was good. Yeah. I liked him. For sure. I think it's like he, you can see he has an intensity about him, but then also he doesn't look like someone you would expect to have like a dark side. Yeah. 
very like skinny kid. So I have this other character who I haven't explained yet. Uh, her name is Miracle. And she's like super ambitious, trying to graduate in three years. Like that's why she's there. And her character is she's like really smart. And so she actually bails when people start getting killed. And the reason that happens is afterwards, she's the surviving character at the end of the movie. That's like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Cause like I was, I, I chickened out, but in the sequel, I'm going to be so fucking there. And it's going to be like a, <laughs> Oh, Mir- miracle survived. And she's going to be played by an actress named lovey Simone, who was in one of my favorite movies from last year, uh, Sella and the spades, which was the, it's this college comedy about these like cliques and clubs in a college and it's kind of like almost like the mafia. It reminds me a lot of Ryan Johnson's Brick, where it's like this world and these characters take the world so seriously, but it's like at this prep college. Mm. So that's uh, Lovey Simone playing Miracle. Just like really a fucking great lead performance. She she is Sella yeah. and Sella in the Spades. Mm. For Ruben, the comic relief character that has the scary Chris Nolan sequence, uh, I have Jacob Batalon, uh, also uh, aka Ned from the Spider-Man movies. Oh awesome. yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a great just, choice. Yeah. Just like you just an instant like mood brightener. Yeah. Um, and so uh, another character uh, I haven't mentioned yet. So this character named Marcy, who's this like Latina punk, like rock chick with like a Mohawk and like a leather jacket and the whole deal. And uh, her, I want her to be played by an actress named Isa- Isabella Merced. Uh, oh, most I know that name. For playing Dora in the Dora the Explorer movie. That's why. Oh, yeah. That's a left field choice to play the Mohawk person. Yeah, yeah. She's been in some other stuff, too. She was in, like, a Netflix rom-com or something. Yeah. And and so her thing is, like, she grew up, like, like Mexican Catholic. So she has these visions of, like, getting dragged to hell and, like, mm. God smiting her. Oh, wow. I this, I, She's, like, she's in her grandma's house. That's her nightmare. And her, her, her mom's like, don't bother your grandma. She's in her room doing her rosary. And then she like peeks into the corner of the room and you see this shadowy figure in the corner, like moving her arms like she's doing the rosary, but it's like, she's like a hag, like a demon. And then she like gets dragged into hell. And that's like the big set piece sequence of like, you know, how much religion can scare the shit out of you when you're a little kid. Yeah, I love it. That's very clever. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, rounding out last one, uh, the first kill of the movie is uh, Saxon has a TA that's like his lab assistant and is like kind of in cahoots with him. Her name is Ivy and she will be played by Haley Lou Richardson mm. from movies like the edge of 17 support the girls Columbus. Yeah. And she's like on the phone with her friend wandering the halls being like, Ugh, I'm stuck with the fucking professor again. And then like the f- voices, the voice of the friend turns into Freddie and like, I have this idea when I was a kid, I went to a reptile house off the side of the freeway. It was like the super sketchy, <laughs> Texas backwoods like reptile house where it's just a bunch of reptiles and glass and they were so close to me and each other <laughs> that it like freaked me out and so I like the idea of her being like chased in the in a library she thinks she's being chased by like these reptiles and bugs and stuff that's that's, good. that's a good one so yeah. I never mentioned it but one of my recurring like nightmares I'll occasionally have is I will like I'm not necessarily afraid of snakes like I'm mm-hmm. afraid of spiders. But I've never had like a spider nightmare, knock on wood, but I have <laughs> snake nightmares all the time. And it's it's always confused me, but I'm always like, I'll take it. Like if I'm going to have a nightmare, <laughs> right. this is sure. better. Yeah, I'll take, <laughs> I'll take the fear I, don't, I can't explain versus like yeah. the thing I know I'm afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But a bunch of uh, reptiles like, yeah, I can see that. I've been there. It's not great. <laughs> no, yeah, it's the worst. Can't step anywhere. There's just snakes. So that's my cast. I like it. So mine, uh, obviously, my Freddy Krueger is Glenn Howerton. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I think that he's a very, he very easily could play a Ted Bundy type. Um, and I think that he would be able to play the creepiness of Freddy Krueger in like full blown, you know, sweater and uh, claw mode as well. Mm-hmm. And the scars and all that. And then for Nancy, the murderino and the final girl, I have uh, Lana Candor uh, from... Yeah. To all the boys I've loved before. Yeah, to all the boys I love before, uh, amongst other things. Uh, she was uh, in Deadly Class, I think, as well. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And we she was Jubilee. Yeah, yeah, she was Jubilee. Yeah. yeah. She was Jubilee. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, Lana Candor for that. Um, for Glenn, the character that is her 
boyfriend and uh, was played by Johnny Depp in the original. I have a uh, solo Mara Duena. Uh, oh, cool. Cobra Kai. Yeah. Uh, future blue beetle uh right yeah yeah uh, so yeah so i have i have him in that role she is he is sort of going to be this guy who in my mind glenn is like he puts up with the true crime stuff but he's not like into it sure he thinks it's, her it's a thing. little it's a little weird but he's also just like yeah but i just you know it mm-hmm. it helps like i feel like it helps her anxiety yeah. you know like whatever but he's like no i'm not gonna I don't, i'm tired of listening to murders it's depressing yeah. Yeah. yeah right right so he's got that kind of vibe but then like kind of falls in love with the concept of of the whole true crime thing like during their sort of like research of unraveling this conspiracy uh, he gets caught up in the story he gets caught up in it yeah and then they sort of like glow, grow closer of course like just as like he's the last body to drop so then as Tina, the the uh, the fake out protagonist who who dies first, um, I have Sydney Sweeney from White Lotus. And Euphoria. And Euphoria. Yeah. Uh, I know her from White Lotus. But no, yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it just because like I, I feel like I like her in this role because she feels like a protagonist. Like she feels like the person that you would be following right now. She feels like Drew Barrymore and Scream, you mm-hmm. know, where it's just like, oh yeah, obviously this is the main character. Oh nope, it's not. Never mind. Forget, right. forget yeah. that. <laughs> and I and she just has a cool energy, and I think that she could play scared really well. Yeah, I just I really like her a lot. And then as Rod, uh, their their gay friend who is just trying to be supportive but gets blamed for a murder he didn't commit. <laughs> um, I have uh, Justice Smith. Oh, cool. From Detective Pikachu. From Detective Pikachu. Yeah. He's so great. Yeah. I really want to watch that show Generation on HBO that he's in. Yeah. Didn't it get canceled after one season? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You can't tell anymore. Like, well, I guess it was a limited series. (laughs) You know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. True. A lot of stuff is getting tragically canceled before it's time. Right. That's a solid cast, man. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Uh, Cool. So then next question is, Nick, who do you have for writer and director? So uh, I have I have a writer and a director, mm-hmm. uh, so two separate people for uh, writing the screenplay. I have Lee Janiak or Janiac, mm-hmm. the uh, writer director of the Fear Street trilogy. I did I purposely did not put her on mine because I knew you would pick her. Oh, <laughs> great! You, you, you know me so well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I was obsessed with the Fear Street movies this past summer. Yeah. Uh, this the they were Lee Janiak's Janiak's first like films or you know first like trilogy of films she wrote like she wrote and directed this indie that I hadn't seen like a couple years ago. She could have easily directed this, but my director hasn't directed a horror movie yet. Mm. And that kind of curiosity piqued me, but you know, we just got three amazing Lee Janiak horror movies in a row yeah. this summer. So I was like, "Oh, just like, you know, she can write the shit out of it and then pass the ball to a, a director." And the director of that movie is Tyresha Poe, the director of Sella and the Spades. Oh, it's uh, if you, yeah, I, I would check it out. I think it's still on Amazon Prime. That's how I saw it last year. She's just really good at creating a world. Like the school is like old. It's an old university, and it has like there's a moodiness to it. And a, there's like a sequence where, without spoilers, a character accidentally like roofies themselves or like drinks like hallucinogens that they weren't supposed to. And it leads to this trippy dream sequence in the woods. Mm, And that, that scene, I was like, Oh, it'd be really cool to see what she could do with like directing a horror movie. Yeah. Cool. I think that's that's a great idea. That's exactly what I was trying to find. With, oh, okay. with my director was like <laughs> someone who had never done a horror movie, but you could picture what that horror movie is. And I just, I, I, nothing was coming. I mean, this was, this was torture trying to find uh, oh, a, a writer and director for this. Oh one. no. Um, <laughs> Thank you but, for not uh, using Lee Janiac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was just, it was, well, and I felt, but I felt the same way that you did where it's like, oh, well, okay, I've yeah. seen three Lee Janiac horror <laughs> yeah. movies, uh, yeah. like a month apart from each other, like pretty different yeah. horror movies too. Right. Right. So I was just like, yeah, you could, but it almost feels <laughs> too easy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I ultimately, I, I really struggled with this and then I was like, well, okay. So you have a bunch of people trying to figure out a mystery and then, you know, you have some like creepy imagery and things like that and so i i went with someone who like he's directed horror movies before um but like 
I'm picturing the the paranormal activity version of his stuff. And so I went with Christopher Landon. Um, oh, cool. Because I was just thinking like, yes, he has done like Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to you and Freaky. But I, that's not really the vibe that I'm wanting. Right. Yeah. This is much more like grounded and. Yeah. Dark. So then I would. But I was thinking about the marked ones, the, mm, the fourth right. paranormal activity. And like it has a lot in common with like what I'm wanting to pull out of this. It's like a bunch of kids goofing off, but then like unraveling this mystery and lots of like cool, you know, creepy inner imagery in a way that is, you know, abstract that I like. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. interesting. I never thought about it, but yeah, like the happy death day movies and freaky are very horror comedy. Yeah. Like purposefully trying to be like back to the future or, you know, very stylized, but yeah, that paranormal activity movie, they want you to really, feel like these are real teenagers hanging out in a bedroom like yeah being stupid yeah yeah <laughs> so that's nice. uh that's who i went with for my writer director oh it's a hyphenate got it yeah cool yeah he I wrote he wrote paranormal activities two through five five yeah yeah because marked one is the fifth one not the fourth one that's my mistake yeah so he wrote two through five and directed five and then directed scouts guide to the apocalypse and then the happy death day movies and then freaky last year. Oh, so, which is works. a freaky Friday riff in case Got you it. didn't know about that. I did not. Yeah. Now on HBO a, max. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a freaky Friday where the victim and the mass, like Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees character swap bodies. And so, oh. Oh, I did hear about this. Yeah. And so the girl is walking around in Vince Vaughn's body, like, you know, acting like a teenage girl. And then, like, Vince Vaughn, who was, like, the hulking, brooding killer, is inside the body of, like, the, the teenage girl. It's a good idea. Like, yeah. It's great. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's a fun good movie. movie. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really fun movie. You can't ever watch it, Sam. No. But it is a really <laughs> but, fun, funny, great movie. But it sounds like the sort of thing that I might sit down and, like, read the script for. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Every once in a while, I need that. to sit down and read the script. So, like, I read the script for uh, Cabin in the Woods. I read the script for Get Out just because, like, oh. I needed to for. Oh, yeah. The script for yeah. Get Out is great. And, yeah. Because yeah. I was referencing stuff like that for stuff I was writing. But, yeah. All right. Cool. So, to make myself feel useful, <laughs> uh, let me take us back through our casting. And <laughs> then that's basically it. We have two movies. <laughs> Excellent work. How, how has this ever happened before on your show? rarely but i think so okay Sweet. like occasionally people have come in with such strong ideas that i'm like let's just walk through both of them <laughs> oh cool yeah yeah nice like I, I think it i don't know i can't think of an ex of a specific example and it's never been this distinct but i've definitely <laughs> had multiple movies in an episode before it's happened yeah okay. i think it just goes to show what a how ripe this premise is for reinvention yeah yeah and how much you both enjoy and care about it Yes. But, yeah. All right, cool. So The Nightmare of Elm Street. Uh, <laughs> uh, Freddie will be played by Samara Weaving. Dr. Saxon will be Lawrence Fishburne. Josie will be Helena Howard. Olivia will be Hunter Schaefer. Austin will be Tyler Alvarez. Miracle will be Lovey Simone. Ruben will be Jacob Batalon. Marcy will be Isabella Merced. Ivy will be Haley Lou Richardson. All this will be written by Lee Janiak and directed by Tyresha Poe. And then for Nightmare on Elm Street... <laughs> Freddie will be Glenn Howerton. Nancy will be, is it Lana Candor or Lana Condor? I think Condor. I think yeah. it's Condor. Uh, Lana Condor. Uh, Glenn will be Zolo Maraduena. Uh, Tina will be Sydney Sweeney. Rod will be Justice Smith. And this will be written and directed by Christopher Landon. Mm -hmm. It's a couple nice. of movies. They'll, <laughs> they'll come out, one at the beginning of October and one at the end of October, and then they'll fight. Yeah. yeah. See which one wins at the box office. Yeah, the yeah. inevitable, the inevitable Freddy versus Freddy movie. I Whoa. mean, it's what, it's what the people want. <laughs> Crisis of Infinite Freddies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, cool. I unique episode for so many reasons. Thank you both for being oh, a part of I it. I forgot. I almost forgot. His serial killer name is the Nightmare on Elm, like a Nightmare. Oh, on that's Nightmare on Elm Street. Like that's his. That's, That's like what the like, news coined as. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Anyway. Right. I'm like glad you got that in. That's important. Like instead <laughs> yeah. of the Scranton Strangler, it's the Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> awesome. So uh, thank you both for being here. I guess talk about the different podcasts that you two run. Uh, well, we're both the co-hosts of Franchiseography. Mm -hmm. The podcast where we dive deep into the uh, the histories of Hollywood's biggest film franchises. 
the uh, the Spy Kids series is about to get started. And it, it's, uh, it's going by the time oh, it's going right now. It. It's almost yeah, over, it's, I think. When, oh, okay. So <laughs> it's like the, uh, I, I looked it up and I think that my episode came out October 9th. And I think this episode comes out like October 28th. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, that was a fantastic episode, Spy Kids 2. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was that was so much fun. I learned so much about moving around rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stretching a dollar. That's yeah. right. It's so yeah, it's, we're it's we're great. about to <laughs> launch our Wes Anderson franchise uh starting next month in November, where we're covering all of the live action films of Wes Anderson, which we have decided is a franchise because he much like a franchise, it has a very distinctive look and feel uh, and rules to it, and also <laughs> recurring cast members. And so it feels very much like a franchise, even though it technically isn't. And the most important rule for any franchise, you can buy it as a box set. That's true. Very true. Uh, that's actually a pretty handy rule. In, yeah. In, 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 a, in a pinch. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. And one day, I'm sure we no one will be able to stop us from covering a Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, that's right. going to happen at some point. The yeah, question is, do we do we end up covering Freddy versus Jason twice? Or do we cover both of those franchises simultaneously? Holy that, shit. So that makes my brain hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Freddy versus Jason? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> We're calling the Freddy versus Jason franchise like a 32 movie <laughs> yeah. super franchise. <laughs> That's a full year of just like <laughs> slasher movies. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, like, okay. <laughs> I feel like that's the sort of thing where like you'd have to do that, that as a fundraiser. Like if you're raising money for something and it's like yeah, you just have yeah. like 15 minute bursts on each movie over like two weeks. Mm. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Or like we'd have to take like a year's plus break if we had to do two episodes of Freddy versus Jason. Yeah. <laughs> just to like have something new in the second conversation oh man yeah well, or we just or we just re-release the episode again yeah, I'll just super late. there we go story hadn't so, changed since, <laughs> since you're both here and i as much as i enjoy having uh writers on the podcast i also need to ask you both to talk about geek by night yeah that geek by night is the audio series that scott and cass Fredrickson and i uh produce and write and direct with a huge ensemble of of actors and musicians and you know yeah and and i don't know when it's precisely that's coming back off the top of my head but we are like in full production of the final handful of episodes and we know how the show is going to end and i'm i'm already really proud of what we have cooked up yeah for the record yeah, you... i don't know when it's premiering either so <laughs> <laughs> for sure. uh, but perhaps a month from now you will maybe but but doubtful we'll yeah <laughs> it doesn't it, it doesn't matter the important thing is that you two made like a show like yeah. a show show and it's incredibly impressive and everyone should go and listen to geek by night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Sam. Yeah. But it's highly it's... serialized. So start at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Remember that's the cool thing is like the internet is like, you know, until like Skynet comes online or whatever, like it's all just there waiting for you to find for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's 36 episodes available to listen to. So yeah. it's a binge binge listen. Uh, so one of the so as I do, we make as a part of the Dueling Genre Network. One of the things we're going to be starting to do on Dueling Genre is cross promotion, talking about other shows. And the show I want to talk about today is Tales from the Short Box. Mm -hmm. If you enjoyed comics and all the comics I mentioned today uh, for today's episode, you are might really enjoy this weekly podcast. Basically, Tales from the Short Box is a weekly Wednesday podcast where they talk about the comics that came out during the previous week. Uh, the hosts are Adam Sheehan, Casey Crawford, Sean Petit, and R.J. Veidt. Yes. And they talk about their favorite comic books from that week. It's like a Wednesday poll list, but as uh, comics. So yeah, if you are an, a comic book reader and you're an avid, like, staying up with current storylines person, Tales from the Short Box is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Every Wednesday, uh, just like comics. Just like comics. <laughs> so now I got to say, Scott and Nick, uh, social media handles. Where, where can people follow you and find out more about the uh, current things that you're saying? Like, hypothetically, if they're interested in when Geek by Night might come back, where should they follow you in social media? So... As soon as that information becomes available, they'll know. Uh, at Dueling Genre would be a great place mm -hmm. to just stay up to date on like, like our Patreon content and you know individual podcast releases. And then uh, my personal Twitter is at Nick M Jimenez. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, you can follow at Geek by Night uh, if you want to follow Geek by Night stuff, or at Franchiseography for Franchiseography stuff, or you can follow me at Scott Corelli. Cool. And if you want to follow me, I'm at Sam Gash, S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H on Twitter. 
or you can follow the podcast at Ideal Remake on Twitter or Instagram, or join us on Facebook at Ideal Remake or Ideal Remake Podcast. Or if you enjoy listening to your podcast on YouTube, there's an Ideal Remake uh, YouTube page. But the best thing you can do for any podcast, for Ideal Remake, for Franchiseography, for Geek by Night, is to go on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It always helps, and it's always appreciated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you all so much for listening to the just like all uh, Nightmares on Elm Street, a surprisingly complicated and multiple story <laughs> episode. So we will end with this. Nick, Scott, what is your favorite quote from the Nightmare on Elm Street? Ooh. I can pick one uh, from part three that I watched this week. Uh, Fred, <laughs> where uh, a nun calls Fred Krueger the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. Yeah. Excellent. And then they take that and they go way too far with it later in the oh. franchise <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah but, but, yeah it's a, no it's a great line but then they literalize it later and it's oh, uh, okay yeah oh, i don't weird. think i've seen that one weird yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, i can only imagine how they literalize that <laughs> yeah it's not pretty i'll tell you that um i you know it, it's funny i just can't i here's the thing okay so i love the quote of the the nursery rhyme one two freddy's coming for you three four mm -hmm. better lock your door five six grab your crucifix seven eight gonna stay up late nine ten never sleep again i think that that rules but i think my favorite quote isn't really a quote it's a well it's a poster quote um <laughs> a pull and it's quote it's yeah it's a pull quote and it says it, it is if nancy doesn't wake up screaming she won't wake up at all right. that yeah. rules that That's absolutely rules <laughs> <laughs> awesome